Good evening, Bill Woodman. Good evening, Cindy Robertson. Hmm. It is dark and dank and raining and cold. What what happened in England? It became England again? Yeah, and we were promised an <laughs> Iberian blast in a sort of heat wave of late summer, and instead we've got dreich nasty torrential blahs. rain. Yeah, it feels like a it's like a standard medieval uh, British fall over there. <laughs> I don't like it. Let me have summer. Well, you know, you can move somewhere where it's not cold and rainy all the time. Hmm. Where would I go? I wonder. Portugal. Mm, I think I might go to Croatia. Croatia. There's a good option too. Well, Italy. Anyway. Please. Are you saying you're going to flee from where you are? <laughs> no, and I, I know I'm laughing, but I don't want to make light of it actually, because um, I have borrowed this, our topic tonight, directly from what I use as my dialogue material with the group that I work with yesterday. Okay. And the reason I did that was because I had planned to do something else with them. And then the other evening, I sat down to watch something on TV with David and he said, this is a really good thing. We need to watch it. And he turned on a Storyville documentary and a Storyville is a series on the BBC. You can get it on BBC iPlayer and it runs all different types of documentary. This one uh, was an animated documentary about a man called Amin who had fled from Afghanistan and through a very convoluted, painful journey, emotionally, psychologically, and of course, physically, geographically, um, ended up in Denmark. It's an animated documentary with some sort of snapshot moments here and there throughout the film to show you that it is actually a real person in a real place and not just mm -hmm. a kind of disnified moment of suffering, but it's really had this very sort of profound impact. That sounds naff. It has had a profound impact, but what I want to say is just that sometimes you see something that you know is happening, but you can't sort of get any purchase on it. And I think this, particular movie documentary whatever you want to call it has helped me to see something that I couldn't before okay so anyway I will put a link <clears throat> if I'm able to to the iPlayer Storyville it seems like it's on Hulu in America if that helps okay anyway that's the movie poster the most moving piece of cinema I saw this year. I mean, anyone could have said that. I don't think it matters who said it. Just that that sentiment, I think, has been shared by people all over who have seen this. Sure. And it got me thinking about um, when we talked about retreat last week. Mm -hmm. And as it so happens, it kind of ties in with this because the questions surrounding this notion of fleeing of having to flee I have a kind of relationship with the questions about why do we retreat um and now I'm asking what is it we run from uh, can, can I can I zag just a scooch on that and and ask like you know the whole idea of where we're from and how we identify with that and how we see who we are based upon where we're born or where we've been for 10 years emotionally or, you know, a job or what, you know, all different kinds of levels of stuff, depending on how you want to cut it up. Um, that's always fascinating to me. Um, you know, how we define ourselves. And for so many people, it is the where is such a huge part of the definition of who we are. You know, you're, you're a Scottish woman in England, you know, like that's the first two sentences of the byline, 
you know, the, the, of, of, of your biography. Um, sure. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's also yeah. really important to think about how impactful even that is. You know, I'm essentially just down the road from where I'm from and I did not flee. Right. And, and yet still I have problems. I have an issue in me about being from somewhere different. Um, I, I Do you think people see you differently because of that? Um, no, because, you know, it's kind of incognito, isn't it? You know, I, I'm walking about in, in England and I'm a white woman and yeah. I didn't have a particular um Do you still have a bit of the accent? So that must come out when somebody actually talks I, to you. I do. So when I open my mouth, maybe that's the difference. I yeah. mean I do find it interesting on holiday. I think there are some people, people like me who have quite a quiet personality and persona. Um you know, you can go by about being quite unnoticed in places and sure. because of that when you are noticed people assume you might be from wherever you're standing it's a weird phenomenon yeah um i don't really know where i'm going with that all i know is that this the idea of having to leave is, is Vers so versus and, and you know it's interesting you say it have to leave uh versus choosing to leave or, or versus, I mean, I guess there, there, are, there are reasons to leave, to leave that are independent of you in the sense that, you know, it's a war torn country or some kind of religious thing, or, you know, all kinds of those sort of external reasons to flee versus sort of internal reasons to flee, say somebody who lives in the country who wants to move to the big city or that, you know, those kinds of things which are similar, but different, you know, obviously not yes, at the I same mean, level, but. What makes us leave is really, you know, the thing that separates us in the action, mm -hmm. isn't it? So, you know, I, I might flee, I guess in one way from negative experiences in childhood or, you know. Sure. But equally, I can say that I was still safe whilst I was in the motion of fleeing. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yep. this is a very different account. Of, of course, obviously. this is, this is on the whole other level kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And of course then, I mean, if we're going to bring it into a sort of art specific context, I wonder if there's something about the nature of having had to fight for your survival in some way that means that the work of artists who've been themselves refugees or have been born to refugee parents, for example, if their work becomes even more vitally expressive somehow, or sure, you know, I, I or or I think <clears throat> you know I met a I met a man who was a Auschwitz survivor uh, a couple of years ago, yeah, and he was an artist and he showed me his you know notebooks from. 1946 that he bought in Paris when he got out of the camp and like, you know, finally got all the paperwork done so he could go start living his life again. And, you know, he had a very sort of Bauhaus, let's keep track of everything each day that I worked on very structured sort of way of, of working. But I think to some extent, he went the other way. I mean, I'm sure his experiences were infused in his work, but it was also an element of, I just want to get back to some sense of normalcy, despite the terrible thing that I went through. My art is like the refuge away from all of that versus an expression of all of that, you know? I mean, a famous artist friend who shall remain nameless yeah. said to me that he wonders if all artists are in the process of fleeing. Like artists- That's interesting, yeah. All, all artists by their nature are maybe hiding. I can't remember his exact words, but it was kind of like, you know, as artists, we mask who we are with our art, yeah. you know, which is counter and actually opposite to what I might otherwise have thought, which is that to be an artist is to express what one perceives oneself. I'm sorry, I'll be right back, sorry. 
anyway, viewers, whilst Bill is fetching his Amazon parcel, yeah, I do sorry, want to recommend. Keep buzzing until I buzz the thing. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. I do want to recommend seeing this. I want to 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 name the the creator. It's a, a Danish <laughs> filmmaker, um, Jonas Poer Rasmussen. I think I said that right. Isn't it interesting though that they that they chose to make it an animated thing versus some sort of recreation or all interviews or you know I mean like you could have made this story any one of many ways, but they made it in a way that made it not impersonal, but like it, it took it out of the completely real sphere to some extent, right? By animating it. No, there's several things about that. One, it reminded me very much of watching Waking Life, which is Richard Linklater's movie from i think 1998 where um you know because sort of pioneering animation technique was applied over frames you know similar yeah. i guess uh, finding vincent uh, no sure. loving vincent sorry is very similar it painted upon each, each frame was sort of redrawn as animation versus real yeah yes that's not this i mean this style of animation is is in one way much more simplistic but actually what I thought was very effective about it being in an animation was that um, in, because of the way the animation looks, it, it, it's like having a wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay. You know, what is being dealt with here is something so powerful and traumatic. Yep. And, you know, sequences where things are very threatening feel threatening of course but otherwise we might be being soothed rather by that animation and then it punches you in the face the point of it yeah it, it was so clever um and the other thing i i thought was good about it is that there were allusions to certain aspects of violence, for example, sexual violence, that weren't then graphically represented. Right. And I felt that gave the chance for this to be seen by a younger audience. And then for me, for example, as a parent, to have conversations about what is there I felt it was giving me a lot of of places at which I can sort of jump off to to help myself, to explain to myself, but also to explain to my daughter. There's many things about it. I, I would be able to show this in school, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really great. You know, there was nothing that meant it's going to get axed by a, a censor or by somebody saying you can't show this to the under 15s or something. Sure. People should see this. What would, can you go back to the thing that your uh, artist friend was saying about artists fleeing? Well, the sense that an artist flees from himself mm -hmm. is, is in a perpetual state of running away. It's an avoidance. Sure. I mean, I, I actually think that of all visual art forms, photography is the most guilty of that. You know, because by definition, almost always the person taking the pictures on the backside of the camera. Well, we're in avoidance mode, aren't we? We're looking yeah. at life through the lens. We're not looking at life. Although mm -hmm. one could argue that in a sort of more in a philosophical way, I am living because I'm living whilst photographing. Yeah. But Some people could argue that the editing, the process of editing and putting a frame around something is distilling life, you know, down to, but yeah, I don't know. Anyway, as I said, lots of artists have suffered, haven't they? And, and part of that suffering 20th century history is littered with artists who have had to flee. I mean, we talked in the past about Charlotte Solomon, mm -hmm. uh, Life with Theatre, that extraordinary work of 
3,000 or so little watercolour studies and drawings that she made, you know, on the run. But interestingly for her, on the run from the Nazis, yes, as a Jew, but also on the run from other things, sexual abuse, um, death in her family, her mother's death. And yet at the same time in fleeing there is like resolve and there's obviously pathos and other things that are actually sort of brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that the traumatic thing itself is brilliant, of course not. But there's so much to learn in all these things. You know, it, what I always find interesting like in, in a situation like this with like you know mother and child or that the 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 younger people who are going having these experiences and going through these things they have no sense that it's abnormal you know what i'm saying to you know it's like they're like the, and oftentimes the adults around them do everything they can to hide the terrible things and and make these weird abstract moments of simplicity the the thing that gets remembered you know what i'm saying it, it's it's hard for me to put it into words but it's like it's like this this play like this this drama that's going on is is behind the curtain a lot of times you know i mean life is beautiful really sure stunningly presents that no sure yeah um, exactly anyway yankel adler i I find his work kind of haunting, really. He's an avant-garde painter. The reason why I know about him is because he was in Kirkcubri, near Glasgow, well, and in Glasgow for quite a long time, where he met other artists and sort of a sense that there was a sowing of seeds or a spreading of kind of artistic idea. He introduced a lot of Glasgow artists and uh, I guess it would have been the late thirties, maybe to to modernism, really. But I mean, he was always on the move. He was born in Poland. He's a Jew. He was persecuted, like so many Jews were in Europe, um, and kept moving. Fled to France, to Paris, where he set up an avant-garde group of painters who were also, you know, resistance political. Um, and all the while, still managed to capture in a, this very kind of representational way earlier on in his career, um, as you described, these kind of moments of stillness or n normality. Yeah. You know, a woman and child doing you know, something so ordinary, waiting on a bench. It's not that they're waiting to learn their fate in a grand yeah. way or a dramatic way. They're just waiting. Yep. You know, like you might see anybody waiting for a bus. Yep. The fact that this particular pair might be waiting for some other reason that's more malign or unsettling, disturbing. Sure. It's not really important. Anyway, I mean, as he got older, he started thinking in a much more abstract way, kind of ghoulish at times, really. Um, and he did learn, I mean, before he died, he died in 1949. By that point, actually, he lived near Marlborough here, very near to me in Dorset. In okay. Um, yep. I don't know if this rather finished him off, but he learned that his whole family had died uh, in concentration camps. Sure. But that fleeing, the process of it, the action of it, really drove his work. It drove him to move about enough also that he was able to, I guess, experience a wide cultural base from which to draw and also uh, from it, which to, yeah. to teach and speak and spread ideas. It's also interesting that, you know, certainly in the, in a lot of these situations whether it's you know 
Irish and Italian immigrants to America in the 1880s to to, to 1900 or whatever, or or Jewish immigrants in the in the 30s, you know, getting out of Europe or whatever it is. How for their descendants, it's also a weird renewal if it quote unquote works out. You know what I'm saying? It's like a whole new page that gets turned, and 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 they have a different life because of it. So it's like almost like they're paying it forward. Sometimes the people who are take the risk of getting across, like all the people on this boat, my God, if something happens to that boat, you know? Well, I mean, the other thing that prompted me in amongst all of this, it's, you know, is it coincidence or is it just that it happens so often? The other day there was a dreadful event in the channel, again, English Channel, 12 sure. migrants died. I think 10 of them were were female children were they trying to get over illegally i didn't read into the details well i mean every day there are hordes of people attempting to reach the uk because the uk um, is a better place to be than france or belgium i i don't know those reasons truthfully yeah. i don't i mean i can't imagine that the uk is Well, I don't know. I'm not going to say something awful about France as a as a nation, but what I do know is that that those migrants must really want to come to England. I mean, this is this is the constant conversation here in the United States on the southern border. It's like these people walk th walk through the jungle for you know four months to get to the southern border. It's just like they didn't do this because they, you know wanted to screw over everyone in America, they were doing it because they wanted a better life for themselves, which, you know, it's, it's incredibly complicated. Um, but something that comes up in this, and I mean, this image, I think won lots of surprises, which is no surprise, Mar uh, Massimo Sistini. And um, apparently he photographed almost an identical photograph almost exactly a year before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at any given moment, one could be in a, an Italian naval helicopter flying over the space between Libya and Sicily and would encounter highly likely boats full of people attempting to reach Europe. Maybe even the same people he sees six months later going across the channel. Well, indeed. But he did say something about how powerful it was for the the helicopter to hover there and for him to look down his lens and see all those faces staring back up at him yeah you know desperate people yep. people as you say wanting to make a better life but that sounds too that sounds too pleasant doesn't it well it's 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 <laughs> it's yeah i, I don't Not i don't mean that. it to be sound like a cliche but 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 that is the big part of it though just like this idea that where we are is so awful for whatever reason, we need to go try to do something else. We're gonna give up everything we have in order to do it. It's crazy. There's a lot of strife about a barge that's in Weymouth Bay or just off Portland along the coast here mm -hmm. that has essentially been like a detention center. It's a barge moored mm -hmm. just off i guess it must be portland naval base really with something like tents like, on it or something what do they do no i mean they just put young men who were seeking asylum you know, asylum it, onto the barge in what must have been utterly horrific conditions in many ways People in Weymouth, not all of them particularly happy about those people on that barge. Others sure. not happy that people were on the barge because of the humanitarian issue of having so many people shoved onto something that keeps them at arm's length when they have made often perilous journeys to land safely. Um, yep. you know, so many things come up. Discuss migrant the word migrant put it into a conversation with people and it's like a 
like a touch paper. It's like flame, isn't it? It's I mean, so re refugee terrible. is a similar word, right? You know. Yes. Well, that's um, indeed. But but arguably more sympathetic. Well, maybe it seeks that sympathy up to a point, but what else can one give to that word? Sure. This is a terrible quality version of this photograph. I watched his video, by the way. You did? Right. Yep. So. Giles Julie, well-known celebrity photographer, living the high life, has a sort of depression slash revelation that his life is vacuous, empty, and lacks meaning. And so abandons his glamorous lifestyle and for a short spell goes and works in Care, he becomes a carer, full-time carer. Yep. And eventually sort of comes through the other side of a bleak depression and decides that as he is a photographer, I think the first place he decided to go to was Eritrea. Yeah, I mean, he was obsessed with Don McCullen, right? Is that was, the, I think, from what I've... Sir, Don McCullen, Bill, get I, it. I'm... Hey, listen. Dame Sandy Robertson. <laughs> if I married Don McCullen, would I be a dame? I think you Maybe. should call him up right now. He's still alive, right? <laughs> oh yes. When I when I saw when I saw him last. Yeah. I when did he had last at dinner. I, I did try and give him a kiss, but he wouldn't take it. No such luck. From you. I don't believe it. <laughs> anyway, the Giles Dooley went off, then subsequently traveled more than he ever had, even as a, you know, movie star, glamour globe trotter, trotter rather. He then traveled the world in a very different context, photographed scenes of abhorrent human behavior, scenes of humanitarian crisis, war, you know, people ravaged by these terrible things that befall them. Um, anyway, 2011, he stepped on an IED in maybe Afghanistan. Yeah. And had his legs and arms. Both of his lower legs and his left arm, yeah. Blown off. I think his throat was ripped as well. I mean, he, obviously, a, a, just a totally. Miracle of modern medicine that he survived in any way. Yeah. Anyway, after then, quite a lot more time, he's gone back out into the world to continue photographing. Yeah. And he was commissioned by UNHCR or something to go and photograph the migrant crisis as it was unfolding in the wake of the Arab Spring. This photograph is from a series he made on Lesbos which is one of the islands in Greece that many migrants land on or land at after again making a perilous journey across the Adriatic, or I suppose it must be the Adriatic. Anyway, these two women were captured by him um, walking along and he'd seen them several times over the course of his photographing apparently and he asked them where they were going. They were going to a transit station um, to go and welcome and sit with newly arrived refugees and he asked them why they did it and they said that both their mothers had arrived on on these beaches as refugees in the 1930s sure Turkey, which i assume meant probably you know something like the, the smyrna disaster you know they seem to want to sort of have a pay back into the world for the good life that they'd been afforded because of the risk their mothers took. Right, yeah. Um, to, to repay society, repay 
whoever, God, whatever, I don't know. Yeah. But goodness me, it seems that everywhere in the world there are people running. And well, I think there's constant shifts like gravity pulling water different places on a on a hilly plane kind of thing, you know. Hmm. Like I would over um, mention just whilst we're on and you said about it, you said you watched it. What Bill's talking about is a, a wonderful TED X talk that Giles Julie did that's titled something like uh how I how I managed to become less unhappy. Yeah, yeah. Like, how, how I got over happier. unhappiness. Yeah. So he's not telling us how to be happy. He's just explaining how he stopped being unhappy. Yeah. Sandy's tell is sending it to me to uh get me out of a funk, but yeah. Um <laughs> I, I just I just think this is such a fascinating area. And I mean, from an art historical point of view, um, art kind of populates itself because of the cross pollination of people from everywhere. Yeah. And a lot of those people cross pollinate and their paths cross because of trauma, because of crisis, because people what? have had to move migrate around this planet in dire circumstances and they've had to flee. I think that those people, I think th those situations, whether it's, you know, something happening in your country and you have to run or in the case of him, you know, getting half of your limbs blown off, like the, in, in that trial comes some sort of deeper understanding if you live through it, you know? Um, well, again, just back to the word flee, he did describe um, Giles Julie described waking up in the hospital bed in Birmingham and and wanting to to go back and die where he had first been struck down you know why sure. let you live I want to run away from my life and you know well, that might seem churlish or small-minded now after talking about well, at the, at the at the moment, though, he could only blink to communicate. So I think he was in he was in a place where he thought, if this is where it's going to be, I'd rather not be here. You know, which. Okay. Yes, I know, but I'm mean, not just talking about him now. I'm talking about sure. any of us who might want to escape our lives. Sure. Or aspects of our lives. And how much of all of these things are so dependent on things that you have no control over, where and when you're born what sex you're born, you know, all of these things, right? I mean, these are all. I mean, can you imagine that there's been so much from Ukraine, mm -hmm. from Gaza, Palestinian people mm -hmm. who want to flee. <laughs> sure. Afghani women, half the people in Iran, like, you know, all kinds of places, right? But what I mean is that right now, as we sit here speaking, can can we sort of tune in to that anguish? Do we know it's I mean, there? Do we really know it's there? You know, we can pay lip service to an idea, but we can also, I think, really take stock of what causes people to flee. Are we, are we, are we helping ever? Do we, do we act like these women and go to assist or do we just deny somehow? Do we put it to the back of our mind? Oh, it's not us. Yeah. There are a lot of, uh, right now in New York city, there's a lot of young migrant families and, you know, women and men with little kids who yeah. came over to Texas and the, governor of texas just ships them to the cities in the north to like make a political point there's a bunch of people and like they're having a hard time and they're like you know they're the thing right now is that the women will buy a bunch of candy and they'll put it in a box and they walk around the subway selling candy and gum for two dollars a piece and um and invariably they either have like a little toddler on their back in a sling or there's like a little kid running around next to them as they go and it's like that kid has no idea what's I mean, he may have very well have an idea what's going on, but still in this sort of unknown state. And 
it is, it is a, you know, you can do what you can. Some people, I saw one woman and a guy and their family had a sign up, like looking for work, you know, in English. And in my neighborhood, it wasn't that far from where I live. And this guy stopped and he walked over to them and he was like, Hey, uh, you know, I know like three blocks down that way and to the left, like there's a guy looking for men to help do X, Y, Z, you know? And as the guy walked away, the kids started walking in that direction, you know? It's like, there's, there's like a simplicity in the need to actually do these things in order to survive, you know, that it's just like that there is no choice, you know, we're here, we're doing this, we've got to make a go of it. And there's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's both very difficult to watch and also humanity affirming to see people helping each other, I guess. I don't know. It's tough. It is complicated tough. stuff. I just think now though, that we can really take stock of all those many thousands of people who are attempting to flee for their lives and can't. I also think often about people fleeing and being so brave and then befalling even worse fate in so many ways. You know, people who have to leave where they're from and then get holed up in like camps or are then trafficked or exploited or sure you know the fleeing part is almost like a clean wish <laughs> it's yeah. almost like oh yeah they don't, they don't know what they don't know what's ahead there's dreams that are ahead but you're not thinking about the bad things they're thinking about the good things most of the time probably and it, then it strikes me that we maybe should be looking for those who have fled mm -hmm. like when we flee are we looked for so do you many... think it's a responsibility for others to look for those people? Yeah, I do. Uh, and yet here I sit talking about it. What do I do? Right. Watch, watch a movie and think I know. Yeah. Very difficult thing to accept about oneself is the sheer um, complacency. Yeah. And, and in a lot of ways, powerlessness. I mean, people have been moving around the globe like this forever you know i think we just are able to see it even more nowadays anyway if anyone's watching watch flea. Let's go watch flea and if anyone's watching go and watch giles julie talking headache yep put the uh put the video in the in the uh description on the youtube yeah. anyway okay. bill Lovely to speak to you. Uh, as always, uh, highlight of my week. <laughs>